Welcome to Hub Dialogues. I'm your host, Sean Spear, Editor-at-Large at The Hub. I'm honored to be back in conversation with David Frum for another installment of our bi-weekly video and podcast series on the key issues concerning Canadian policy and politics. We're speaking today on National Indigenous Peoples Day, and in particular, we're discussing a new report to Canada's federal government from a special interlocutor that it appointed just over a year ago to investigate possible claims of unmarked graves and burial sites stemming from the country's experience with Indian residential schools in the 19th and 20th centuries. The report has generated considerable attention and debate, most notably its recommendation that the government ought to consider legislation that would effectively criminalize what it calls, quote, residential school denialism, unquote. We'll discuss the report and its recommendations, the inherent challenges of criminalizing open discussion about the past, and the importance of addressing contemporary challenges standing in the way of progress for Indigenous peoples. David, thanks as always for joining me. Thank you so much. Uh, we should start with some context, particularly for non-Canadian listeners and viewers. Um, bear with me for a brief minute, David, as I set it up. Um, Nearly two years ago, there was a discovery by way of ground penetrating radar data of possible evidence of unmarked graves of as many as 215 students at a former residential school in Kamloops, British Columbia. The finding was followed by similar cases elsewhere. The Canadian government, which apologized for residential schools in 2008 and paid out compensation to many of those who attended, soon provided funding and resources to investigate these claims. As part of that action, the government also appointed a leading Indigenous lawyer to serve as a special interlocutor on these issues. Up until now, the search for unmarked graves is not borne out, though it's possible that they're found at these sites or elsewhere at some point. In parallel, the special interlocutor has carried out a process of consultations and research to produce her interim report, which was released earlier this month. A final report is expected next year. Okay, let me pause there and, and come to you, David. Um, the initial evidence of possible unmarked graves in 2021 rocked the country. The Canadian press called it the story of the year. The flag was flown at half mass for more than five months. Canadian Canada Day celebrations were curtailed. What do you make of Canadians' reactions to these reports about unmarked graves? And what do you think it tells us about our collective commitment to reconciliation? Well, um, in the in the summer where the, these events exploded, um, I interviewed uh, one, one of the leading historians of the residential schools, J.R. Miller of the University of Saskatchewan, then just retired. Um, and Miller had published a book in the 1990s at a time uh, t telling the story, which is, was, has been known for a long time. It's not a new story. And he, but he was the first to really document it, uh, bring it to public attention, try to quantify it. There, there are missing records. Um, uh, I mean, not willfully missing, but the, the records have just were never centralized. They have not been properly consumed. He was the man who did, did the real work to bring this to national consciousness. And he told me he could not get an article published in any Canadian newspaper, never mind the major papers, but even a, his own local paper in Regina saying, uh, this is a terrible tragedy, uh, lives were lost, this is in no way a genocide, and uh, this was in no way intentional. Um, and it, I ended up not writing uh, a story based on this, but the thing that struck me was there, there was this explosion of feeling but a, a, a remarkable lack of attention to knowledge. And the reason we're talking about this today is so much of what happened um, in those years remains uncertain and contested. There's much to talk about, uh, but much of the discussion is, is leading, and misleading, and sometimes I think quite willfully misleading. Um, an example of the willfully misleading exam, uh, is the um, report in 2015 on um, missing indigenous women which was written as if to suggest that there had been a campaign of murder by outsiders of Indigenous women, when, as what the RCMP testified, as the ministers of the Crown noted, that 70% of the cases involved an, a, a fellow Indigenous offender, typically in the context of sexual or domestic violence uh, between people who are either intimate partners or who are no, previously known to each other. Um, and that, that's no kind of excuse for this appalling violence, of course, but the report published in 2015 was willfully, I think, willfully misleading. So as emotions have cooled a little bit, as attempts to bring some science to bear, as, as you said, as it has been discovered that these disturbed grounds do not probably contain unmarked or mass graves, and that if the graves were unmarked, they were unmarked because, not because they were never marked in the first place, but because the markers um, fell apart over the passage of time. Um, 
that this that the newest thing is to say, well, all as as this unwelcome to some information comes forward, let us make it illegal to bring forward unwelcome to some information. And that is really alarming because Canada must face its past. Of course, as all countries must, but it also needs to face the, the fact that its past is not as dark, not as negative as some would like that past or to represent that past as being. And that needs to be able to be said without the state saying you can't refute statements that are either maybe untrue or misleading or even willfully misleading. Yeah, I, I should say that the interlocutor's report contains useful information about some of the practical and legal challenges associated with investigating possible cases of unmarked graves or burial sites from res Indian residential schools. There are issues, for instance, with respect to records, as you say, technology and even jurisdictional ambiguities. Um, the government should consider many of its recommendations. Um, but as you say, I, I think there is a lot of debate about the rec recommendation concerning so-called denialism. Um, why don't you just elaborate on, on what you see as the inherent problems uh, with criminalizing discussion uh, about these issues? I don't think we can get past this threshold fact, which is there is a lot of money at stake here. And I don't think maybe, maybe all Canadians don't um, understand how much because the way the federal government accounts uh, for they, they separate both current expenditure and then the vast sums that are being paid out in in settlements. But the Fraser Institute put all of that together in a report that was published last year about the um, uh, in expenditure on Indigenous causes and settlements in 2022. And basically, Canada is spending almost as much on all Indigenous claims, or was in 2022, as it spent on national defense. So it's, uh, these are vast sums. The exploration of the disturbed grounds, that cost in the hundreds of millions of dollars. Um, and of course, uh, and when that much money is at stake, and there's other monies at stake too, more indirectly, because um, a, a lot of the national intense feeling about these issues has become a, a, a political resource to block, for example, the development of critical natural resource infrastructure, pipelines especially. And then the pipelines then pay out monies, not that are not registered in the public accounts, but that are in effect public expenditures because they're required by the public in order to get to give permission for these projects to go through. So tens of billions of dollars are at stake. Um, and when you have that much money at stake, um, that it, the idea that we say, well, we can't, uh, if, and if some of that money is being um, claimed on the basis of uh, reports that are exaggerated or misleading or distorted, and, and to say that it is not, it's not a mere intellectual interest that would make you say, well, then we should suppress criticism because if the criticism comes forward, some of these payments may be disputed. And the report claims that uh, denialists were seen trying to dig up unmarked graves at one of the possible sites in Kamloops. It, it's hard to know what, if anything, happened. It doesn't provide much detail. Yeah. Uh, otherwise, the report's claims about denialism, which is imprecisely defined, more generally are anecdotal. Um, of course, I'm not saying there are people who diminish the conditions at residential schools or the consequences of the system, but it seems to me like increasingly a fringe position. Uh, what do you ex think explains the odd dichotomy between broad public acceptance of the negative consequences of, of residential schools and these growing claims about denialism? How well, can we reconcile these competing perspectives? Yeah, well, I, I, I did a little experiment um, before uh, our gathering here just to so to, to test how for myself what happened i i um retweeted a story that was um unearthed by um the dorchester review a very interesting historical journal um and from 2021 um where one of these uh, uh one of the sites where there had been disturbed ground was investigated and no bodies were found so without comment or editorial i just i just put this on twitter to see what would happen and what, what was very interesting what happened was um, that people got very angry that I was linking, and again, no editorial comment, linking to this story. And then others would say, um, well, it doesn't matter that, that um, what the exact facts are. What matters is what the larger truth is. And so what I notice in a lot of the debates is there's a, there's a toggle uh, between when you're talking to people who are not well-informed, maximal claims are made. And when confronted with adverse evidence that the maximal claims are not true, that there was no genocide, that these, uh, that, um, that the suffering that happened was the result of, you know, bureaucratic incompetence and underfunding, and that the worst of it happened 
uh, before the lifetime of any living person, um, and that uh, 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 that the, the and that the graves were may, may have the, the markings may have. Um, fallen down or disappeared, but the graves were not originally unmarked. They were not mass graves. There was not uh, there was not murder behind them, which is what the mass graves was intended to suggest. That comparisons to you know the uh, Soviet when you, when you point those things out, people then you know retreat and say, well, that's not what we're talking about. What we're talking about is this terrible human tragedy that occurred in these in these institutions. So. Uh, that's and it's an example of why this discussion is so important because when it's not discussed, maximal maximal claims are made that are false. Um, th that when and I think some people or people would say, well, confronting those maximal claims that's denialism. That anything that says uh, what activists don't want to hear, anything that casts doubt on that is denialism and must be forbidden by the state. Well, the reason it must be forbidden by the state is not because it's some fringe point. It's because um, it's powerful. That's why they want it uh, forbidden by the state. It, it seems to me, David, that one of the regrettable developments of the unmarked graves issue is that it focuses discussion on the unknown and away from what we know. Uh, as I wrote last year for The Hub, it distracts from the, quote, incontrovertible and terrible facts about residential schools, including the roughly 31,000 former students who received extraordinary compensation because of their cases of mental physical and sexual abuse. Uh, in that sense, why are we debating about unmarked graves? Isn't what we know bad enough? Well, because we're not, when we talk about the past, we're talking about the present. Um, so Canada has gone through a series of approaches to the Indigenous problem. And the, the, um, and the earliest part of the residential schools um, failed experiment happened at a time at times when Canada was working very hard to make to assimilate Indians into the uh, nation of Canada. Um, the John, that this was Johnny McDonald's idea that uh, that um, this population who had had been hunters uh, whose game populations had disappeared, the buffalo had been had, had disappeared from the um, prairies and plains, try to make them farmers, try to teach them English or French, try to Christianize them. Um, and then in the, in the 1950s and 60s, that there was an attempt to bestow citizenship on them to uh, fold uh, Indian nationhood into, into Canadian nationhood. And I think certainly uh, the consensus in today's Canada is those approaches failed. They led to a lot of human suffering. They were maybe wrongly conceived to begin with. And so now there's a new approach. And the thing that we want to not ask is, how is the new approach doing? Um, the new approach is vast direct subsidies um, to Indian communities or indigenous communities, um, which are then created as semi-sovereignties. Our suicide rates going down, our rates of sexual abuse and domestic violence going down, is substance abuse going down? Are we producing more successful human outcomes? Um, and is, is there any way, is, is there any way to measure what we're doing now? And what will Canadians 50, 60, 80 years from now think about what we're doing now. And a lot of the a lot of what we're do, seeing is an attempt to put all of those questions back in the box. Um, is is uh, I mean, as I say, we're spending tens of billion, uh, almost as much as as on national defense, uh, on various kinds of direct income support, either to communities or individuals. Is that producing better outcomes? And at least as my understanding, and I'm not any kind of expert on this area. But my understanding is, um, not only are the outcomes bad, but the outcomes in Canada are worse than the outcomes in the United States. Um, and that is something that Canadians need to think hard about. And a lot of this uproar is has the effect of blinding Canadians to the consequences of what they are doing today. I would just say in parentheses, David, um, along the lines that you just outlined, as sometimes I'm concerned that activists and indigenous organizations and other leading voices on in these on these issues prefer to focus on the historical and the symbolic rather than the concrete in the present, um, because the latter in, involves trade offs. It 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 re requires tough decisions. It may require it may involve fissures um, within indigenous communities themselves. Whereas if we're focused on um, abstractions um, or um, symbols. Um, um, these organizations and these voices are, are free from the imposition of those trade-offs and challenges. Um, in, in that vein, um, of course, we have to confront the past, but as you say, we can't let it define the present. 
how can we strike a better balance? So we're not merely looking to the past, but we're also seizing on current opportunities and accentuating um, some of the, the challenges that, that you've outlined. Well, um, I, I think uh, we need fewer taboos. We need fewer taboos. And, and this discussion in Canada is very taboo ridden. Um, we need, uh, we also need to say, look, um, you, you know, as, as, as some, you can't, that we need fewer fictions. Um, and if we're going to, for example, one thing that, that you might want to do is integrate the telling of Indigenous history into the Canadian story. Don't start the textbook um, when Europeans touch foot on Canadian soil. Start the textbook from, you know, the retreat of the glaciers and really integrate that. But that means if you're going to do that, that means, um, you know, telling, for example, that uh, indigenous um, groups had histories of conflict. So one of the things you will hear at, whenever you go to a Canadian event is they do these land acknowledgments that makes it seem as if all of these different groups were, you know, you know, it, 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 I say it's also, we are here um, in uh, Strasbourg, the traditional lands of the French and the Germans and the whole and the Holy Roman Empire and the Romans and the, like these people were at war with one another and they did not accept each other's claims. And the idea that the French and the Germans historically were the this is the, historically shared a patrimony in Alsace that obviates a lot of history. So, so, uh, so tell that history, um, include it. Um, and uh, I, I've seen studies, I'm not sure how reliable these are, that when you ask American college students, do they agree with the statement that before the Europeans, um, indigenous groups in North America generally lived in peace and harmony with one another, um, that, that they belong to the same human race that the rest of us do, um, that, that these kinds of myths are, are not serving anybody. So integrate this. Then we need to ask questions. Is, is it good for people um, to... Uh, earn their livings as, as perpetual dependence on state sub subsidies. Is that good for people? I and mean, where you try that with non-Indigenous groups, do you get successful life outcomes? And if you don't, why do you think the, the, uh, the outcome would be different? Um, and so we need to be able to um, not hive off parts of the Canadian national experience. And at least that's how it seems to me. Uh, we published an essay this week by one of the Hub's best writers, Ginny Roth, on the case for some form of mandatory national service for young people. Uh, it galvanized strong feelings on both sides of the issue, but it made me wonder, David, if one of the challenges with indigenous issues is that they're so distant from the so-called lived yeah. experiences of many Canadians, including those in cities and suburbs. Is that a problem in your view? And what, if anything, should we do about it? Oh, well, there was a powerful essay and, and it, I don't pretend to have a, a fixed view in response to it. It, made, it certainly did make me think um, and, uh, you know, just generally we see in, um, modern societies, a lot of uncertainty and aimlessness among young people, a lot of people floundering around as they say, what should I do with my, with my life that may, maybe this would, would help a lot of people. It would bring people more into contact with one another. It's got some, um, it's, 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 it's a rich topic for discussion. Um, but what I, what I would say is, is, is guilt is usually a poor guide to action. And guilt is an especially poor guide to action when it's based on um, facts that are not held up to true historical and scientific scrutiny. Um, let's wrap up by, by looking forward. Um, you know, notwithstanding some of the issues we've, we've discussed uh, today, there are some signs of progress. Um, we, we have a, a great essay um, published today, uh, June 21st, by a regular contributor, Karen Rastoul, on evidence of what she describes as economic re reconciliation occurring uh, through partnerships with resource companies uh, and um, other means by which communities are um, pursuing economic empowerment. Um, what can policymakers do, in your mind, David, to um, help make progress on those areas so that, as you say, we don't look back 50 or 60 or 80 years from now and, and find Indigenous people stuck um, in, in the same set of challenges um, that, that, they, that they did in previous generations. Well, look, this is one of the most intractable areas in Canadian public policy, and so many things have been tried and so many things have not worked. Um, so I'm not going to stand on a soapbox and say, I have the answer. Uh, but uh, um, what I... Am sure of is you have to be able to talk about it. 
and you have to be able to talk about um, the uncomfortable things, the uncomfortable things about Canadian history, but the un uncomfortable results of present day Canadian public policy. And you cannot, and, and there, there is, I think, an attempt, I don't know how conscious it is, but um, to mobilize feeling, um, to suppress, oppress, and even sometimes intimidate uh, the acknowledgement of realities that a lot of people know um, and, and that uh, go increasingly unsaid. And uh, it is a, a dangerous situation to create um, gaps between what people broadly know to be true and what people feel free to say, uh, because they don't forget, they, they don't stop knowing what they know, um, but they do stop believing what they say. And they do stop listening to people who tell them things that, that are, are fictions. And, um, uh, and these, um, this attempt to create a um, kind of a state ideology based on this idea of reconciliation, when at the same time as you pursue policies that make people less reconciled one to one to, one to each other, that's not going to go anywhere, anywhere good. So um, I think the, propo the specific proposal to criminalize so-called denialism needs to be hooted down. Um, the attorney general should have said immediately, well, obviously we're not doing that. Um, and, and then I think we should have, we should be turning to people like Professor Miller and saying, you know, you were there at the beginning. You should, you should, newspapers should publish what you have to say. It's important. Um, I'm not saying he's necessarily right, but it's important. Um, and the idea that there are vast categories of knowledge that become unsayable, that's dangerous. Before we wrap up, David, if I may just, uh, on a personal note, observe um, that I grew up in Thunder Bay. Um, there was a residential school at the end of my parents' block. Um, my, one of my best friend's dads went there. Um, Charlie Baxter, who was the, the principal figure in the residential school class action, R versus Baxter, um, was represented by lawyers in Thunder Bay. So I've I've seen and experienced the consequences of failed indigenous policy in Canada, including, of course, residential schools. And you know, if, if I could kind of make one plea to, to listeners and viewers, it's that we ought to be, we ought to be uh, galvanized um, by the fact that, as you say, David, there are people living within our country uh, who, um, who live in some instances something like third world conditions, whose economic and social outcomes diverge so significantly from national averages. This ought to be a, a, an area and a subject of, of mobilization and reform and ambition. And as you say, the risk of some of these developments, even if well-intended, if they stand in the way of that kind of uh, reformist streak, uh, the risk of course is uh, we, um, we we threaten current generations and future generations of indigenous people living in the same challenges as their predecessors. And that ought to be uh, a national um, a shame and a source of national embarrassment and hopefully uh, an inspiration um, for different and better outcomes. Yes, that's beautifully said. Um, and the only thing I would add is, and, and we should ask ourselves, what will the 2080s think of us? Uh, I think that's a great way to wrap up this conversation. Uh, I want to thank you for 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 uh, speaking with me on about this important uh, topic, uh, David, and I look forward to catching up in a couple of weeks.